Well, you know, the Lord earlier this week put a message on my heart. I haven't preached out of the book of Esther in a while. It's before I knew about all this going on in Mozambique. And so we're going to talk about for such a time as this today. All right, so the last couple of weeks I've been talking about the favor of God. Favor is your purpose. Last week, favor is your inheritance. And I mentioned how we are guaranteed favor, which is from the same Greek word that we get grace from. It's from a Greek word, charis, which we both get favor and grace. It means benefit. And so we're guaranteed favor or grace because of Jesus Christ. We are completely accepted in him, loved by the Father, never ever to be rejected. Our inheritance is in him. Favor is part of our inheritance. Do you believe that? Do you believe that if Jesus increased with favor and wisdom, that it's an example for you and I in the 21st century that we too can increase in wisdom and the favor of God? Romans 8, 16 and 17 says this, the same spirit agrees with our spirit that we are God's children. But if we are children, we are also heirs. We are God's heirs and fellow heirs with Christ. If we really suffer with him, so that we can also be glorified with him. Uh, None of us like suffering. We don't like persecution. But in the midst of the suffering, Jesus is glorified. But the greater news is, neither death nor life nor angels nor powers or principalities, nothing can separate us from the love of God. We have God's stamp on us. We are children of God, the heirs of God. Eternal life is our destiny. And by the way, you're living that eternal life right now. Now, I shared the last couple of weeks, we see examples all throughout the Bible in church history of people who obtained favor with God and with men. For example, Noah, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Abraham found favor with God. He, God said, I will bless you and you'll be a blessing to, to the nations, to the peoples. Joseph, we talked about Joseph last week, how Joseph in the midst of being misunderstood, falsely accused, wrongly imprisoned, found favor with God and was a posterity for God's people. I briefly mentioned a couple of weeks ago about Esther. We'll look at her a little closer today. I also looked at Mary and how Mary found favor with the Lord and gave birth to Jesus. Favor was increased upon their lives because they carried the heart and purposes of God for their generation and future generations. Favor is for a purpose. And those who will carry God's purposes in their generation should expect to increase in favor and grace to accomplish the impossible. God grants favor to those he can entrust with purpose. Keep in mind, just like us, they weren't perfect. In fact, some of them had some huge flaws, made some big mistakes, but God's hand was on them. I mentioned some who, out of Matthew's gospel last week, who were in the very genealogy of Jesus himself. We see those that had struggled at different points in their life, and yet the grace of God came on them such that God used them in the natural lineage for our, for our Savior, Jesus. It's amazing. In fact, I shared last week how Joseph's coat may have been stripped from him, but God's calling and purpose for Joseph could not be removed. That's the same for you and I. God's destiny, his plans, his purposes, his calling for us cannot be stripped because of our bad choices, the circumstances that we find ourselves in, or even persecution that may come against us. As Joseph partnered with God, his destiny was fulfilled and realized generations, generations to come were impacted because of his life. Now let's take a little closer look at Esther today. Uh, If you got your Bibles, go ahead and go to the book of Esther. We'll be picking up in Esther chapter 2 here in just a minute. Now, if you look at all in the news headlines, uh, mostly the news is rather negative, isn't it? Rarely do we hear positive news. Uh, I, I find it interesting lately. We've had such good economic news, but it seems like most of the news media is very reticent to report that. They would rather focus on some other things. But we have all kinds of negative news headlines. If we're not careful, we could focus on the negativity. And just what we're seeing this week, even what's taking place again in Africa, uh, this type of genocide and, and terrorism and these type of things, there certainly is no shortage of human suffering. But just like with Esther and the potential genocide she and the Jewish people were facing, 
God raised up not just Esther, but her cousin Mordecai, and even a pagan king, to be used in that moment to avert genocide of a race of people and to, uh, to release God's purposes in the earth in this hour. We should understand in this moment, church, that we are called to partner with God, not just to reach people on an individual basis for Christ, and that's powerful, and we certainly need to do that. But we are called to disciple nations. We are called to impact nations with the very gospel of Jesus Christ. Our expectation must be in this hour that the nations of this world, the kingdoms of this world, will become the kingdoms of our Lord in Christ. Amen. Right now in Mozambique, for example, I believe some of the persecution is, is because of the great outpouring of the Spirit of God through that ministry, Iris Ministries, and the impact in the realm of the kingdom they're having. They've, they've broken ground to build a university there. It will be first class in that nation. It will make an impact, and all of a sudden this evil comes at them. Are we surprised? But you see, when we recognize that our calling and our purpose and our destiny is, is sure, then we can advance even in the midst of extreme adversity. Uh, to say that we live in a complex world and challenging time is an understatement. Yet amid all the adversity in our world, we, you and I, brothers and sisters all around the world, we are here for such a time as this. Ecclesiastes 11.4, I'm going to read it out of the Living Bible. It says, if you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. Your kingdom opportunities are now, irrespective of the conditions in the world, while there is timing involved, we must live with an expectation, expectancy from divine initiative. Uh, yes, at times we can see something in the distance that we know maybe we're called to. Maybe there's uh, training that we need. Maybe there's more experience that we need. But we need to be forward-thinking and forward-looking and forward-gazing, if you will, to see what it is that God has put our hand to and to realize my life can make a difference in my generation. Your life can make a difference in this generation. Just like Esther, as we'll read about, you are destined to impact the world around you if you will partner with God faithfully and dare to risk when he asks you to risk. Now let's look in Esther chapter 2. I'm going to read 1 through 7, and we'll look at first at three distinct issues in Esther's life. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now, let me just give you a little backdrop. For time, I don't want to read through chapter 1. But this pagan king has a queen, Vashti. And he throws this king around, uh, you know, the king throws this big party, this big banquet. And he wants the queen to come. And she doesn't come when she's summoned. He gets really angry. And I want you to see this first, before I get into this about Esther. The first thing that we see that's an injustice in this story of Esther and the Jewish people is the oppression of women. You see, right at the very end of chapter 1, we see now the king, because he's upset, because when he commands the queen, one of many of his wives, to come, and she doesn't come when she's commanded he now sets forth the decree that wives all over the kingdom must obey their husbands. And you can read over that verse real quick, but if you really understand the cultural context, you'll understand that women were considered second-class citizens in those times. And sadly, in many parts of the world, they still are today. That's an injustice, and it should not be. They were considered property. They were considered at the disposal of their husbands. Wrong and injustice. And so in the midst of that injustice, all of a sudden God, through that circumstance, is after something more. And it starts with a, a girl who's an orphan and a Jewish orphan girl. So we see this. After, th after these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's servants who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. Now this may sound lovely, but again, it's more oppression. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom that they may uh, gather all the beautiful young virgins to Shushan, the citadel, into the women's quarters under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women, and let beauty preparations be given to them. Then let the young woman who pleases the, ki the king be queen instead of Vashti, this thing pleased the king, and he did so. 
I want you to see even in the midst of this oppression, God's going to raise up a deliverer. In Sushan, the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Kish was Saul's father. Remember King Saul? Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, it's his cousin, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. Esther in Persian means stara or star. Three distinct issues in Esther's life. Number one, she's an orphan. Mordecai adopts his cousin Esther, and he begins to take care of her and raises her as his own. She probably felt alone, probably felt abandoned, probably felt rejected. I don't know about you, but at times I think probably most of us at some point in our life have felt maybe a little bit rejected, abandoned, or maybe not cared for. But here's the good news. Jesus has carried all of our abandonment. He's carried all our rejection. He's carried every bit of, if you will, aloneness that we could ever experience. Jesus carried that for us. He's adopted us as his own. We never, ever have to give in to that aloneness again. We can find ourselves in Christ and in his perfect love secure, and we can find ourselves secure in the body of Christ. The church should be a family that's one of the safest places on earth. Romans 8.15, Paul said this, You didn't receive a spirit of slavery to lead you back again into fear, but you received a spirit that shows you're adopted as his children. With this spirit we cry, Abba, Father. You see, we are no longer an orphan. We're in God's family, and the Father loves us. The second issue that Esther was facing, as I already mentioned, she's a woman. She's a woman in a time when primarily the only advancement that a woman could have was a good marriage, a dowry to move up, but you needed parents for that, and she's an orphan. So here in this very peculiar situation, Esther is swept in and gathered up with all of these young women all around the kingdom, but God's going to use it. So this orphan girl, who's a Jew, least likely, if you will, to, to be in the palace of the king, all of a sudden finds herself in a position where God's favor can be released on her. And as I've already mentioned, her third issue, she was born a Jew. She's in exile, persecuted, looked down upon. And listen, uh, the, the anti-Semitism anti has never really gone away. While Paul talks about this, we are one new man, God has grafted both Jew and Gentile, made one new man. Uh, he also writes, and that's in Ephesians and Galatians, he said that there is neither slave nor free, male nor free, female, Jew or Gentile. We're all one in Christ. That's what Christ has done. Yet I want you to understand that anti-Semitism is still alive and well, sadly, all around the world. Now, it's not just anti-Semitism. There's racism of all forms all, all around the world. And it is an evil. It's a horrible evil. Whenever you have one group of people hating another group of people and genocide or potential gen genocide is the outcome, that is the worst form of evil that humanity has ever faced. That woman is in that situation. She's in an environment that is seething over, if you will, of hatred towards the race that she's a part of. Now... Esther all of a sudden begins to understand change on a dramatic moment. Let's pick up now in verses 8 through 18. So here she's been gathered. So it was, verse 8, when the king's command and decree were heard, and, and when many young women were gathered at Sushan, the citadel, under the custody of Haggai, that Esther also was taken to the king's palace into the care of Haggai, the custodian of the woman, of the women. Now the young woman pleased him, and she obtained his favor. I shared this a couple weeks ago, literally what it means in the original language, Esther lifted up grace before the very face of, of Haggai, this custodian, and it drew out the favor from him, but it was God's hand as well upon this situation. So she has favor, and so he readily gave beauty preparations to her besides her allowance, 
Then seven choice maidservants were provided for her from the king's palace, and he moved her and her maidservants to the best palace, uh, the best place in the house of the women. Esther had not revealed her people, or the fact that she's a Jew, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. Sometimes, folks, you need to use extreme wisdom in the situations you're in. There's a place of faith and there's a place of boldness, but there's also a time for wisdom and discernment, and sometimes you just need to operate a little bit under the radar. Are you with me? And every day Mordecai, uh, in other words, you don't need to go into your workplace and announce to everybody you're an on-fire, spirit-filled, born-again Christian. Rather, love people. Show a spirit of excellence. Allow God you, the opportunities for you to gain favor with people. And then expect God to begin to give you opportunities to share your faith with them. Does that make sense? Sometimes we're on our worst enemy. We're sharing a little bit too much. Uh, so, verse 11. Every day, Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. Each young woman's turn came to go into King Aosaurus, after she had completed 12 months preparations, all of these beauty preparations. I'm going to jump down to verse 13. Thus prepared, each young woman went to the king, and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from a woman's quarters to the king's palace. In the evening when uh, she went, and in the morning she returned to the second house of the women, to the, custodi, the, cust the, the custodian, the king's eunuch, who kept the concubines. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and called for her by name. That's an important piece of this story. So unless she was called by the king by name, she could not go back to the king. Now verse 15, now when the turn came for, es from, for Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter to go into the king, she requested nothing but what Haggai, the king's unit, the custodian of the woman advised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. And I shared this a couple weeks ago. We want to come in before King Jesus with adorned with what he likes. Humility, righteousness, living for him, living with a heart to serve others, all of those kind of things. Esther brought in the, the very clothing and the very fragrances that, the, that, the, uh, that Haggai recommended to her, so she pleased the king. Verse 16, so Esther was taken to the king Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women. And she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made a great feast, the feast of Esther, for all his officials and servants. And he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of a king. Now, I want you to think about that 12 months with Esther in the finest of the rooms in the palace as she's going through those beauty preparations and being prepared for her one night with the king. And she's bathing in all the oils. And perhaps for the first time in Esther's life, she has peace and security, a, se a sense of, uh, of well-being and, and belonging. All of that's going on. In fact, you could say that she's well off now. She's literally gone from being an orphan to being adopted in the king's harem, if you will. She's, all she has to do is play it safe, and she's going to be taken care of the rest of her life. I, I want to submit to you, many of us in our Christian faith are playing it safe because we've sold out security and comfort instead of risking it for everything that Jesus has asked us to do. Sometimes we play it safe in Western culture. We're safe in our economic system, safe in our 401k plans, safe in everything that we have that our jobs can afford because that is the place of security and belonging. But to risk for God to go outside of what is norm is not comfortable for most of us. It's easier to play it safe. It's easier to play it safe on Sunday morning than to get involved and actually make a difference, a significant difference in our world. And so here's the, here's the risk. When prosperity, security, and comfort come, there is a danger that we ignore the very mandate that Christ has given us and the evil that lurks. Where would we be 
If someone like Martin Luther King didn't stand up for the racial injustice in, in our nation in the 60s, where would we be if those voices didn't stand up against the injustice that was taking place? Where would we be if Abraham Lincoln didn't stand against the evil of slavery in our nation and the Republicans stood against the Democrats, by the way, who wanted to, to keep those enslaved and they fought for the 13th Amendment? Where would we be if a drunk general named Grant hadn't stood his ground and fought like a general should fight to make sure that Lincoln got the victory that he needed so that we could pass the 13th Amendment so that he could get reelected. Where would we be in our nation in this hour? You know, it's comfortable in church life, but yet in every generation there is a cry from the very heart of God, for the people of God to recognize the moment in which they live and to see the injustice that's all around them. We have an opioid epidemic. epidemic. We still have a big problem with homelessness. We still have a big problem with hunger in our nation. I can remember a few years ago, then Governor Jan Brewer of Arizona called a special meeting I helped organize and actually wrote the original draft for a, for a day of prayer for our state. That was presented, was edited by a couple other pastors. It was presented to the governor. She approved it. We had a day of prayer. She then gathered key pastors from some of the larger churches around our state, gathered them for a special meeting. This was our, our then governor. And <clears throat> the pastors asked her, Pastor, uh, uh, Governor, what could we do as pastors in, in the state of his in this moment. And she didn't miss a beat. She said, it's the foster care system. It's broken. I need the church in this hour to do something about the epidemic with the, the need for t families for these foster kids all across our state. And you know what, folks? That really has, that was years ago. It hasn't gone away. The need for foster parents, the need for the church to be involved, to help kids get in good families, uh, it's there. It's there. I thank God right here in Tucson for Gap Ministries and what they have done to take care of uh, and really stretching their faith to, to establish foster care homes and, and do the work that they've done in this city. We need those who will stand in this hour to see the need of the hour. Proverbs 22 verse 3 says this, a prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. Uh, you see, uh, you know, how many of you were excited that that horse Justify won the Triple Crown yesterday? Uh, you know, it's just, uh, I, we believe it's a prophetic sign. Justice, right? Triumphs, okay? Uh, it, it's awesome, but I was, as I was watching that horse race, here's what came to mind. You know, we started watching just a few minutes just before the race started, and they, they were kind of showing shots of the crowd, and then the jockeys came out, and then, you know, they showed the picture of the jockeys getting their photo before they got on their horses, and now they're moving the horses out, and they panned back to the crowd. You see all the people there in New York at the Belmont Raceway and everything, and, you know, dressed really nice as they do for all of these horse races. And I started thinking for a minute. By now I'd heard about what was going on in Mozambique. And I started thinking, you know, it's so easy to get so caught up in our comfort. I'm not saying that it was wrong for those people to go to the race and enjoy the day with their family or all those things. Do you hear my heart? It, we are so blessed in this nation. Sometimes we're so caught up in all of those things that we do, and they're not bad things necessarily. We're just caught up in the comfort and living our lives and doing all these things and going to the plays and going to the movies and this and that and going on vacations and everything or going to the golf course or whatever it is. We're caught up in all of these things. And sometimes we lose sight of what's going on all around us. Now let's jump down. In Esther, in Esther chapter 3, for time, I won't read through it. But all of a sudden, the king appoints Haman. Now, he's a descendant of King Agag, of the Amalekites, who the prophet Samuel executed. Now, I don't understand why God wanted Samuel and King Saul to basically create genocide against the Amalekites. I don't understand that. 
I don't want to fully even go there this morning. But for whatever reasons, God directed through the prophet Samuel to tell Saul to kill all the Amalekites, man, woman, and children. And Saul, with compassion, spared King Agag, spared the best of the donkeys and the sheep and all of these things. The prophet Samuel came and he was angry. And Samuel himself takes and executes King Agag. Haman is a descendant of King Agag. He's carrying the bitterness of a race that's had genocide committed against them. You could say unforgiveness was off the charts. And so Haman now, he gets wind that this Mordecai, who's at the gates of the city, is not bowing down to him like the king has directed everybody. Uh, uh, the king has made Haman uh, like governor over the province or over the nation. And everyone's supposed to bow down to him. And Mordecai won't do it. Then Haman discovers he's a Jew. Now, Haman is so incensed, he doesn't want to just persecute Mordecai. He wants to commit genocide against the whole Jewish people that are held captive in that region, in Persia. And so you see the sins of the fathers now being repeated. Are, are you with me? I, I want to speak something, just if you'll let me just go off with just a little bit here. Do not allow unforgiveness to go unfettered in your heart. It is an insidious form of evil that will create bitterness. Hebrews 12, 15, the, in the writer, the giving us basic Christian instruction, warns us about holding on to unforgiveness, which can lead way to bitterness. He said it can become a bitter root that can grow up, and it will trouble many. And I submit to you, it can even cause genocide in a nation. How much lesser and yet equally as destructive in a marriage? We hold on to little things that we're upset about, or, or some infraction. How much between a friendship or a church relationship? Something happens and it doesn't go the way that we think, or we make a judgment towards someone because we've been offended by something they've said or done and we didn't like it. Sometimes it comes by those that are in authority over us, and we don't agree with the decisions they're making. So we form a judgment, we get bitter, and we stuff it, and on the outside we got a nice church face. Hi, how are you doing today? <laughs> Meanwhile, inside we're seething. And we think somehow that it's going to be okay, but what it's actually doing, it's a bitter root that's growing up, and it begins to defile others around you. We want a move of God. We want the Spirit of God to move in power like we experienced in worship today. We want to see the Spirit of God spill outside of our churches to impact our nation, and yet we're holding on to little offenses, something we don't agree with or something we don't like. It can become a bitter root. Haman now is this terrible bitter root, and he convinces the king to, to allow, he says, I'll pay you 10,000 talents of silver, and, and we're gonna, there's this group of people, they're causing a problem. They're, they're not causing any problem. He somehow convinced the pagan king, I'm going to give you money and give me permission that on such and such a day, we will come against this group of people, and we will eradicate them. Mordecai catches wind of it. And I'll pick up in chapter 4, and he understands the urgency of the hour. Meanwhile, Esther is secure in the palace, comfortable, safe, and secure. Remember, favor has been bestowed to her. When Mordecai, chapter 4, verse 1, learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. Where's the cry church for these foster kids in our state? Where's the cry church for the opioid victims in our nation? Where's the cry in the streets for the oppressed, the hopeless, the downtrodden? Church, we have to set the example. We have to cry out with a loud cry in this hour. He went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. He's got clothes of mourning on. 
And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. Then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept them. So in other words, this is what's happening. All of a sudden, the Spirit of God moves on Mordecai, and he's entering into partnership with God, beginning to intercede. And now Esther's like, well, there, there, Mordecai, you're a little bit too upset right now. Let's, why don't you put some nice clothes on and just be a good church person today? It's sort of like this in modern context. The Spirit of God moves on someone or someones in a church context or in a region, and they begin to get distressed about what they see going on. They begin to cry. They begin to pray. They begin to intercede. They have a burden of intercession, and others around them like, oh, well, they're a little emotional. Maybe they're just a little extreme. Uh, you know, they're there. Calm down. We've had a good service today. Maybe we can just help you out and just, you know, go home. Are you with me, church? What if God in this hour is wanting to move on the church in such a way that a new level of intercession comes on the church in America unlike we've seen in some time? It's already happening all over our nation in pockets. And I want to submit to you, this church had a season where for five years on Friday nights we worshipped and prayed and interceded. And I believe God is trying to bring this church, and He's going to do it through these life groups, by the way. God is trying to bring this church back into a place of connectivity with Him and connectivity with one another where we build bonds and we're really real with God and we're really real with one another and we will actually pray until we see heaven invade our families and invade our city, invade our nation. God is beginning to raise up for such a time as this all over. And the question is, as Jesus passes by, will we say yes to him, or will we say, there, there, Jesus, maybe we can just get some nice clothes on you and just help you just, you know, just ratchet it down a little bit. Pastor was a little excited on Sunday morning. You know, after all, let's just go, go watch her favorite show on TV this afternoon and call it good. Verse 5, Then Esther called Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, whom he had appointed to attend her, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Sushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. So Hatchet returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Then Esther spoke to Hatchet and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or a woman who goes into the inner court of the, to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into these king, the king these 30 days. What is Esther saying? Esther saying, Mordecai, I could die if I go in there. He's not requested me to go in there. And if you read between the lines, Esther, no different than many of us, is saying, you know what, I know it's urgent out there right now, but it's safe in here for me right now. Hey, don't you know I have a nice house? Money's flowing, there's money in the bank, the 401k is growing, everything's going fine. Why do you want me to get involved, Mordecai? It's safe where I'm at right now. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish, yet who knows whether you have come 
to the kingdom for such a time as this. And Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Sushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. You see, Esther, like many of us, for a moment, forgot that the blessing was unto a purpose. Mordecai couldn't get the message through to her because of her walls of comfort. You see, God grants his favor for a purpose. He wants to bless us, but the blessing is so that we can impact the world around us. The American church is blessed beyond what we can ever fully imagine. Could it be that we aren't hearing his voice for such a time as this? While it's a complex world and a challenging time to be alive, there are God-given opportunities for the church, but we must see them, recognize them, and act. 1 Corinthians 16.9 says this, Paul said, For a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Paul recognized that he had an opportunity, but he also knew there was opposition and there was persecution, but he did not let it stop him. You see, opportunities have opposition and they have adversaries. The biggest difference between those who seize their God-given opportunities are those who, and those who don't is that a man or woman of faith can see an opportunity in every adversity. Adversity breeds miracles if we have the faith to believe it. American church, we have opportunities to impact our nation and the world in this hour. The question is, how will the church respond. You can hear the news of what's going on in Mozambique currently, and by the way, it's just one in a list of sad stories of persecution, whether it's in Africa or India or different parts of the world, where there's persecution against the church or there's persecution against people groups. It, it's, it's never really ceased. In fact, if you look through the history of the church, in the last hundred years, we've had the highest percentage of those who have been martyred for the faith in any other time in history. And so we can look and we can look around the world and we can just ignore or we can begin to rise up in a new level of intercession and a new level of God. What can we do to respond? And see, now let me just say this. You have to know what season you're in. Some of you are in the room, you're in a place of recovery and rebuilding. Maybe you've been through a hard season in your life. Maybe you've been divorced. Maybe you've gone through some addiction. Maybe you've gone through some financial setback or something very serious. So, and sometimes in every church culture, there are those that are in the men, so to speak. There are, we want you to receive, get poured into, get built up, get stronger. Does that make sense? So we need to have a healthy understanding that while a message like this is to challenge the church to get more involved and active, at the same time, a healthy realization is some need a chance to rebuild and recover. So understand that. But I challenge those of you that are in the room that are healthy, that you're doing well, that you're financially well off, I challenge you, ask yourself, where is your burden? What is your mandate? How willing, how far are you willing to go to see the gospel of Jesus Christ impact the world in which we live? What area of ministry are you serving in? And I just want to take a moment. We have some wonderful, many of you serve so faithfully, and I am so grateful, and Jesus is too. I want to thank each one, ushers, greeters, sound, video people, uh, children's workers, youth workers, all the leaders of these groups, altar team, worship team. The list goes on. Those that help uh, healing rooms, healing ministry, inner healing, all of these types of things. Those of you that reach out. The food box ministry. I, Andre, I want to thank you. You've done a great job stepping in. And those of you that have come along, Rosemary and Pat and Greg and Marion, many of you have stepped in to help see the need and see what's going on to make a difference. I'm grateful. Listen, we need those back there that will serve the kids and serve those as much as we need those that will go into the streets, into the marketplace. Are you with me? And I want to challenge you, those of you that have a, more of a heart for the marketplace, where you work or out there in society, ask yourself, Lord, what is my mandate? What is it, God, that I can do in my generation to make a difference? Because I know I'm here for such a time as this. We have but one life to live and one life to give. 
We have but one opportunity to impact our world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's right now. Now, two things caused Esther not to hear. Same for many in the Western church. First of all, she was in denial. She finally felt secure. I don't want to deal with the possibility of danger. I finally feel safe. And our human desire for security and safety can override our appetite for risk. Secondly, she was distracted. She's distracted by all the blessings, all the material blessings around her in the palace. She forgot that she was there for a purpose. You see, comfort and security can be obstacles to destiny fulfilled. How much are you willing to risk for Jesus? I'm not saying go sell everything you have and go on the mission field tomorrow. But I will say this. Sometimes God begins to nudge or move on our hearts to get involved in some area of ministry. It may cost us earning some extra money to go serve the Lord and what he's asked us to do. And sometimes we're just not willing to do that because we're more concerned about our comfort rather than seeing Jesus glorified in everything that he's asked us. Our safety and security are in Jesus, not the economic, political systems of the world. All the wealth in the world can't stop natural disasters, wars, or disease. Proverbs 18, 10 through 11, in the Amplified, it says this, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The consistently righteous man, upright and in right standing with God, runs into it and is safe. High above evil and strong, the rich man's wealth is his strong city and as a high uh, and as a high protecting wall in his own imagination and conceit you see what happens wealth gives us an economic prosperity gives us the illusion that everything's okay and we're well off the economy's booming right now in america personal savings is going up Jobs, lowest job uh, unemployment in, in, since back in the 60s, 1969 or something I think I re read recently. I mean, unemployment is very low. Pay raises have gone up. All of that's good. But what can happen is we can become anesthetized, if you will, to the need all around us. We become ignorant to the urgency of the hour and the reality that there are those all around us in need of the power and the love of Christ. Now, Equally as important, we need to be careful that we don't give in to the threats of Haman's voice. The evil voices all around us, they'll always be there. We've got to learn to completely trust in God. He is the great I am. Quickly, I want to go over five things that happened in Esther's, uh, in Esther's life that moved her and changed her. First, she recognized the reality of the situation. Denial was no more. She's focused now. You see, faith doesn't deny the obstacles it looks at them, it looks at these obstacles and says, but with God, all things are possible. Somewhere between Esther 4.14 and verse 15, she awakens. All of a sudden, she realizes God is sovereign, but now he's inviting me to partner into something where I can be literally an instrument to bring about God's purposes. And by the way, before I go any further, most of you, I think, know the end of the story. Because Esther was obedient to Go before the Lord, go before the king and, and risk all. She went in before the king after the people prayed and fasted for those three days, and the king immediately extends that golden scepter, and she enters. And now, because she has waited on the Lord, God has given her a divine strategy. And she, uh, she does a banquet where she invites the king and Haman. And then she has them come back a second night, and all of a sudden, God just gives her a download. The king deals with Haman, has him executed, and all of a sudden now she's won the heart of the king. And all of a sudden now the king's given the Jewish people permission to rise up against the oppressors. They can't stop the official decree that's already gone out that's basically allowing genocide to potentially happen against them. But now the king says, okay, the Jews can fight for themselves and stand against what's coming against them. And they prevailed, and they, and they stopped the enemies that were trying to annihilate them because Esther recognized recognized, I can make a difference in this hour. Psalm 115 verse 16 says, the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given or assigned to the children of men. You see, we have responsibility to partner with God. Yes, God is sovereign. Absolutely sovereign. But in his sovereignty, he has given unto man free will, and he's invited man to partner with him to accomplish his purposes on earth. If we say no 
to God's calling and the destiny and the purpose that he has for our life, he will raise up others or another to do what he's asked us to do. Make no mistake about it. You have an opportunity to partner with God in this life to do what only you can do. And who knows, maybe you'll be the instrument to save a generation of people. Secondly, she didn't ask the advisor, how much money? Can we get the military involved? What, what can? No, she called for a corporate prayer and fast. Sometimes we're so busy looking at our natural resources, our gift mix, who am I, what can I possibly do? And instead God's saying, I don't care about what you have or don't have. Will you seek my face and will you hear from heaven and will you begin to release on earth what I've asked you to do? You see, you don't know the truth of any situation until you've heard from Jesus. Prayer that moves heaven is passionate bold and courageous. Esther knew that she needed to hear from God and pray from heaven to earth, not as a victim, but pray from the heavens realm, the heavenly realm of victory and decree. Thirdly, she received divine strategy and favor. Esther, she invites them to a dinner. She gets heaven's strategy in the midst of it. I never would have planned a dinner for, for a strategy like that, but God gave it to Esther. And by the way, guys, uh, God has put as much of himself in the ladies all around you as in the men all around you. There, there are some amazing ideas and strategies and plans in the women. They, we need to value them and appreciate their voice as much as any man's voice. And if you're here and you don't value women in ministry or women behind a pulpit, I, I, you've missed the heart of God's very heart. By the way, God doesn't raise up women because there wasn't a man available. God loves the women, and he sees the anointing in them as much as any man. And by the way, you older, if you can't receive from a younger that I put in leadership or any leader puts in leadership, you have a problem there too, be they male or female. We need to begin to recognize the prophetic hand of God and the voice of God in this hour and stop living out of, of old paradigms of title, position. And if you're not elding, then, I mean, my goodness. If you're not leading, then come on, you've got to step in and recognize in every generation, God is raising up and he is looking for those who will hear his cry in that hour. And they are passionate and they may be inexperienced and they may be rough around the edges. My goodness, I'm still really rough around the edges. But somehow in the midst of it, God says, okay, you step forward, and, I, and I'm going to bless that. And even in, the, in your inadequacy, I'm going to give you what you need. Just keep following me. Somebody needs to hear that today. You are qualified to do what God's asked you to do. I don't care about your gender, your age, your education. Hear the voice of God. And begin to respond in humility and love. Now listen to the voice of counselors around you, but sometimes some of them may talk you out of what God's asked you to do. You know, honestly, if Sharon would have came to me before she went to Africa, I, because of the pastor part of me, the, the, the apostolic prophetic side is like, go take the nations. The pastor side of me is now, are you sure this is what God wants you to do? You're going to leave safety and comfort to go to Africa. Are, are you with me? Sometimes those around you will try to talk you out of the very thing God's trying to get you into. Not because they are not hearing the voice of God. They love you. They care for you. We need to listen to the voices around us, but understand you've got to, be, you've got to have a burning conviction in your heart when God has spoken to stand up. If I would have listened to all the voices around me telling me not to start this church, we never would have started this church, and all of you wouldn't be here today. The voices of Haman, the voice of negativity are all around us. If Martin Luther King would have listened to the voices in, in his generation and many dear ones that loved him and believed in his cause, but if he would have listened to the voices of some of them, he never would have been as bold and spoke out the way he needed to speak out. And we needed an apostolic prophetic voice in our to shift the direction of this nation. And God's raising up those same voices in this hour, and they're going to come in peculiar ways. And by the way, sometimes you use pagan, backslidden, scoundrel-type leaders in high offices. You know what I'm talking about? And maybe their past isn't so stellar. We didn't elect a pastor, by the way. We elected a president. 
And sometimes God will put his hands on someone to get the job done. And listen, we have to look beyond political type things and understand sometimes God will... Do you realize God used the pagan king? He touched the heart of a pagan king to get across deliverance for the Jewish people. When I study, I, I love history, and I, I study history, the Civil War, it fascinates me as I see that, that struggle that our nation was in. When I've looked and studied the life of General Grant, one of the greatest generals, the guy was a drunk, kicked out of the military at one point. And by the way, he became a drunk because he was lonely and separated from his family that was on the East Coast, he was on the West. And then when the Civil War broke out, he, like many others, were then invited to come back in to take their commissions because we needed. Can you imagine where this nation would be if we didn't have those kind of men? And do you realize he was a staunch abolitionist? He hated slavery. Generals got upset with him because he would get drunk before major campaigns. But yet Lincoln recognized Grant can get something done. And he told his advisors, I don't care that he's a drunk. He's winning battles, and we got to win this thing. And by the way, Lincoln, when he got into office, he was not a staunch abolition, but it didn't take very long, and he realized the evil of slavery, and he became the voice against slavery. If Lincoln had not gotten that second term, we never would have had the 13th Amendment. But it took some generals that had the courage to do what was necessary. Listen, church, we are the family of God, but we're also the army of God. Sometimes God raises up leaders with a voice and a tenacity. They're like cactus, prickly as hell on the outside and soft on the inside. Oh, wait a minute, I can't say hell in church. I'm sorry. What? And we wonder, we want to see breakthrough in the kingdom of God in our world, and yet we want things nice and tidy. She got the favor of God. Fourth, she recognized her moment. Esther 4.16, I will go to the king which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. She recognized she had to make a difference. Breakthrough church is never achieved by those with no passion. She had to recognize the moment, the opportunity, and risk her safety, status, and comfort. Opportunities are never taken by the faint of heart. They're always too cautious. There is a place of God-given leadership that he puts on certain ones that can rise up and to get things done. We need to value that as much as those that will love and shepherd and just comfort us when we're hurting. We need everything. We all are working together for his purposes. You see, for some of you, it's not a choice between good and evil. Rather, it's whether you will risk or just be normal and just stay in the status quo. A question for you, why be normal? To walk on water, you must risk. It's better to be a wet water walker than a dry boat sitter, I heard someone say one time. For time, let me wrap this up. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23 through 24, he said, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. To be his disciple implies risk, not self preservation and I can just see the face of Martin Luther King right now I have a dream he risked it all and gave his life so the generation in America could be changed he <clears throat> security and opportunity rarely coexist Jesus calls us to risk based discipleship it's the opposite of comfort and security I just feel led to say this prophetically. Who will be an advocate for the homeless? Who will be an advocate for the foster kids? Who will be an advocate for the kids from divorced families, single moms? Who will be an advocate for the hurting and the broken? Who will be an advocate? Who will go beyond the, the tiredness that we all face each week, the 40-hour work week or the 60-hour work week and rushing through traffic and we're getting home and we're tired and all we want to do is eat something and just watch a little TV? Who will say, wait a minute, there's something more than just sitting in this nice house or, or nice comfort and all of this? I, I, want to, I want to make a difference. 
You are in a place of opportunity, church. A door is opening before you. There is risk and possibly opposition. Will you go through boldly, courageously, and with passion? Your moment is now to realize your future and impact the world. Fifth, my last point, she had great courage. Esther said, if I perish, I perish. She doesn't respond to the atmosphere, but she dictates the atmosphere through her bold faith and action. She went from being fearful and just concentrating on her, on her security and comfort to saying, okay, I'm not going to sit here any longer. It's not a time, church, to fear and stay on the sidelines. It's a time to respond in courage and faith to the challenges that we all face to change our world through radical kingdom living and service. You are an able-bodied minister of Christ. Where are you serving? Where is your commitment? It's time to have bold courage for our families and society. Dictate through love and humility but dictate kingdom reality. Change the atmosphere around you. Esther's risk confirmed that God was the source of her security. And I want to ask you, how much of your security lies in your possessions, position, or reputation? God has not placed you in your present position just for your own benefit, but to co-labor with him. Yes, God loves you and wants to bless you, but the blessing is also under a purpose. Like Esther, this may involve risking your security, sacrificing your comfort, your plans, etc. Are you willing to let God be your ultimate security for such a time as this? Can you give God the best of your time, your talents, and your treasure? Would you go ahead and stand? I went a little longer today. Thank you for your patience. I just feel a real urgency. God, I, this wasn't the message I was going to give this week. Lord led me about Thursday to, to, to shift a different direction, go to this message, and then I started getting the news about what was going on in Mozambique. I feel, church, we have a wonderful opportunity, and it's not just those overseas. It's right here in our own city, our own state. Would you just close your eyes for a minute? Father, we recognize that in and of ourselves, we don't have the resources, maybe even the energy, but God, we know that you're, you're calling, you're leading, empowers us to go beyond ourselves. It's the grace enables us to become who we're not. And so I'm asking right now, Lord, this is an Esther generation. Lord, there are some in this room, and I'm not just saying this glibly. I mean this with all my heart. I see it prophetically. Some of you, and some of you, some of you young women are going to make a difference in this world unlike you've ever known as well as young men, as well as older ones as well. But Lord, I bless what you're doing and what's stirring. It's like a coffee pot percolating right now. I can see it in the spirit, in the hearts of your people. And I release a leadership anointing right now in the body of Christ. I release the boldness of the line of the tribe of Judah. Lord, I, I pray that we come out of passivity and there'd be a boldness that would come on the church in this hour to make a difference. An apostolic church, not this, this church, but the church in the 21st century in this hour. Lord, I thank you for champions for the homeless, those in human trafficking, sex slavery, those foster kids, all the hungry. Lord, I thank you for those that have a heart for social justice as much as winning the lost. And I bless that right now, God. Holy Spirit, I just ask you would just do whatever you want to do right now in the hearts of your people. Some of you just may need to say yes. Some of you may need to just tell him, Lord, I'm sorry for not listening to your little nudges. He loves us. Look, as I was preparing this message this week in my comfortable home, air conditioning going, I'm in a, a, I'm in a season right now in my life where I, I do feel blessed. I feel very, I'm being challenged by this too. So Lord, we give you permission to go deeper in our hearts. That we would see what's going on in the world around us. 
and we would catch your heart for where we can make a difference. You may, as the Lord leads, you may want to come forward and just wait in the presence of the Lord. We'll have the altar team available in a couple minutes. And you just may want to just commit your life to him afresh and just say, God, I'll, I'll do, I'll risk, I'll follow, whatever it is. The call of God is a mysterious thing. The mandate of God is a mysterious thing. I, a leader can give a message like I did today to stir and build faith, and, but ultimately it's something between us and the Lord where we catch his heart and we say yes and only you and God can really see how that works out So if you need to go, go be blessed. Can you go quietly? I just want this sort of a quiet moment here for those that the Lord is speaking to and ministering to.